So let's just briefly discuss for a few moments some of the important technical considerations uh, that need to be made when you design an RNA-seq experiment. So one of the most frustrating aspects of working with RNA sequencing data is that RNA sequencing data inherently has a lot of variability. Right? So no two RNA-seq experiments are going to give you the exact same result or exact same expression measurements. And this is basically due to both biological factors and technical factors. And so the point when you're doing is that when you're doing an RNA-seq experiment, you intuitively want to get some kind of statistical confidence about each expression measurement that you make. And so in order to get that statistical confidence, you have to make every measurement multiple times and very different factors, either technological or biological, so that you can get a sense of you know, how, how good is my estimate as to how highly or poorly expressed each one of these genes is. Right, and so suppose that you're doing like a case control experiment where you're trying to compare normal versus tumor lung samples in humans. Right, and so what you would do is, uh, number one, when you're doing these RNA-seq assays for multiple samples, what you do is you sequence each sample like multiple times and each time you kind of vary technical technological factors. And so, uh, for example, what you could do is you could take like a normal lung sample, you could extract out total RNA, divide that total RNA into two different pools, and then have two different graduate students uh, perform RNA-seq on each sample individually uh, in order to then get an idea of, you know, how much variation is there between uh, different graduate students measuring RNA-seq on basically technical replicate samples. Uh, and similarly, you could, for example, divide samples among multiple flow cells to determine how much variation there is between uh, flow cells for the same level. Similarly, you'd also vary biological factors. Like obviously you would collect samples that are both from normal lungs and tumor, uh, tumor samples from lungs in order to get an idea of how much variation is due to normal versus tumor. Uh, you might also uh, collect samples from both males and females to see what kind of uh, gender specific differences uh, to see what the effect of gender specific variant uh, differences are on gene expression measurements. And so by looking at both the technical and biological replicates, uh, a lot of RNA-seq software will be able to give you some statistical confidence about um, you know, how certain is the software about different expression measurements, and therefore they'll be able to give you confidence about um, you know, if you're measuring like a differential gene expression analysis between tumors and normal samples, how confident are you that the uh, full changes that you estimate are, are real? So one of the trickiest aspects about RNA sequencing experiments is trying to decide how deeply do you need to sequence each individual sample. And so the take home message of this slide is essentially that no matter what you're trying to measure, you should basically keep sequencing until the thing that you're trying to measure stops changing significantly, right? And so to give you an example, if you are interested in detecting alternative splicing events, right? And so you're not, your goal isn't so much about quantification of gene expression, but it's about identifying all the different splice variants that occur. Then one practical way to determine what your average uh, sequencing depth should be is you could, for example, uh, take a few samples out of your hopefully large collection of samples that you're going to sequence. And you could sequence them very deeply, right? And then what you could do is you could run a bunch of simulations where you take your reads that you were able to align against the genome and just start subsetting them, start subsetting the total number of aligned reads down to like, start at like say 5%, then go to like 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%. And just calculate on average, if you only sequenced like 10% of the reads you did or 20% or so on, how many, you know, either like known or novel splice junctions could you identify with that subset of samples? And basically when you do this enough times, you should get a curve like you see on the right, which basically, you know, starts out steep because when you sequence very few reads, you should be detecting new things all the time.
But at some point, you should start to notice that even if you increase your sequencing depth, you don't really discover anything new. And so these curves basically give you an idea of your trade-off between sequencing depth or cost and you know measuring the thing that you care about, which is on the y-axis. And so again, basically what your effective sequencing depth should be is basically where you think that sweet spot is, where you essentially don't get that much more by sequencing more. And so it's worth pointing out that you know, this is a pretty different approach from uh, DNA sequencing, for example, where in the case of like genome assembly, you could basically look at coverage of uh, different regions of your genome as you increase sequencing coverage or you increase sequencing depth. And it's, you know, fairly intuitive uh, when you need to stop sequencing. But for RNA sequencing, it, again, it really depends on whether you're, for example, trying to do quantification in which case you'd be looking at the variability of your expression measurements as you increase the depth. Um, or in the case of uh, detecting uh, splicing events, then you would draw curves like this that I'm showing you here. And so one of the big applications of RNA sequencing is that uh, you oftentimes are interested in quantifying what the relative expression of each gene is in one sample such that you can compare that number across many other samples that you've sequenced in your given experiment. And so generally speaking, as I mentioned before, a gene's expression level is roughly proportional to the number of reads that map to it. But there's a lot of um, important caveats here. And there's a lot of reasons why that raw number of number of reads mapping to a gene in a sample is actually not really comparable across samples. And so for example, um, if you think back to the protocol that I discussed, the basic RNA-seq protocol, I said that you take transcripts and you uh, first fragment them into shorter fragments. And so if you think about it, if you have a gene or if you have a transcript that is uh, say 1000 bases long, compared to a transcript from another gene that's 100 bases long, you would expect on average that the transcript with 1,000 bases produces 10 times as many fragments as the transcript with 100 bases, right? And so in some sense, the number of reads mapping to a transcript is not only proportional to how abundant is the original transcript in the sample, but it's also abundant, you know, it's also proportional to the length of the transcript, right? And so in some sense, you can intuitively see that um, if you want to compare the relative expression of one transcript versus another within the same sample, then you need to have some kind of correction for the length of the gene, uh, among other things. Uh, similarly, in terms of the, you know, trying to sequence RNA in multiple samples and then compare the expression of a gene across multiple samples, the problem with doing that directly is that the total number of reads mapping to uh, a given uh, transcript is also related to the total library depth. So how many reads did you sequence in total from, uh, from a given library or from a given sample in this case? And so obviously for samples that you happen to sequence more reads from or successfully align more reads from, uh, you, you're going to expect the total count on average is going to be higher for any given individual gene compared to uh, samples that uh, you were able to sequence relatively fewer reads from. And so there's been a lot of different uh, metrics that people have invented for quantifying uh, transcript abundance or gene abundance in a way that tries to kind of um, normalize or correct for these factors like library depth or um, gene length and so on. And so uh, historically, one of the uh, most popular, met one of the first metrics that people came up with is what's known as RPKM or FPKM. So RPKM stands for reads per kilobase of transcript per million map reads. And FPKM is basically the uh, version of RPKM for paired end reads. And so there you're just counting the number of fragments per kilobase of transcript per million map reads. 
And so both FPKM and RPKM try to normalize for gene size and library depth. And so I put down the equation for FPKM and RPKM here. Um, I wouldn't expect you to actually be able to calculate this uh, on a quiz or exam, but it's here just for uh, your information's sake. And I've also uh, put a bunch of links uh, to a bunch of web pages that also kind of discuss these two measurements in more detail. And so another pretty common approach to measuring gene abundance is a metric called TPM or transcripts per kilobase million. And so the actual way you calculate TPM looks pretty similar to FPKM. It's just that the order of how you calculate things is slightly different. So again, I've, uh, I've written down the general procedure for calculating TPM and FPKM. And though I wouldn't ask you to actually calculate TPM or FPKM on an exam or a quiz, uh, it's worth looking at these two procedures and just seeing how they differ. And so it's the difference between them is really just in the order in which you, you make certain calculations, but they generally try to address this uh, similar issues like uh, length, of, length of a gene and the library size. And so an important question then becomes, well, how do you know when to use FPKM or say TPM versus raw counts? And so the first thing to note about FPKM versus TPM is that uh, technically speaking, TPM is a, num is a quantification that might actually be more comparable across samples than FPKM, for example. And the reason for this is that the counts or the, yeah, the counts of the abundances of each gene across all the genes in your sample sum to the same thing for each sample. And so in that sense, the number that you're looking at for a given gene is, is kind of like a relative abundance of that gene compared to all other genes relative to the library size. And so essentially by comparing TPMs across multiple samples, you're essentially just comparing the in some sense, the like uh, corrected fraction of the library that could be attributed to a given gene. Um, and that's, in some sense, more comparable than FPKM, where FPKM totals can change across samples. Um, FPKM and TPM are generally good for data visualization because, in some sense, the data is comparable across samples, although, again, TPM may be more comparable than FPKM. Um, and it's also good for calculating things like fold change, like, oh, my gene increased on average, you know, threefold more in my cases versus controls and so on and so on. On the other hand, the raw counts uh, themselves are actually pretty useful for, um, for basically calculating uh, statistical confidence. And so when you measure differential expression testing, for example, if you were trying to compare a bunch of normal samples versus a bunch of, say, tumor samples, uh, you actually need to use the counts. And the reason for this is that uh, the raw counts of the number of reads mapping to a given gene and so on and so on uh, basically tell you something about your confidence um, in the sense that, again, just like when we were looking at gene set enrichment analysis and we were looking at, say, the uh, proportion of my uh, CRISPR uh, screen gene list in terms of like what proportion of the genes are cell cycle genes versus not compared to the background. Um, your statistical confidence kind of increases with the number of, in that case, the you know the size of your your screen, the number of genes you're looking at. Here, similarly, if you're thinking about uh, if you're thinking about the your confidence in the estimate of a gene expression measurement, generally speaking, if your library size is large, then you have more confidence in your estimate of the expression measurement of that gene. And similarly, if your library size is really small, suppose you only sequence like three reads uh, for a given sample, then your estimate of the gene expression level of each gene is is you know, your estimate's probably very poor, and so you're probably not very confident about measurements from that sample. And so in that way, that in, in a similar sense, basically the counts tell software something about the confidence that the software should have in expression measurements coming from 
those particular samples. And so here at the bottom of the slide, I've just included another link, which kind of goes into a little bit more detail about the differences between RPKM, FPKM, and TPM.